Let me invite you to take your Bibles and open them with me this morning to the 26th chapter of 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 26. I love this chapter and looking forward to working through it with you this morning. Bruce Olson was a kid from, I believe, St. Paul and... When he was a teenager, he went off to the jungles of Venezuela. He wanted to be a missionary, and he wanted to minister to the Motelone tribe. This is a tribe that had no contact with the outside world, uh, other than the occasional oil company worker who they would often dispatch. And, And so the... The, the people who knew of them feared them and their deadly spears and poison-tipped darts. No one knew their language. No one knew how to talk to them. But Bruce was determined to bring them the gospel, and God had given him great linguistic gifts so that he, he could learn languages quickly and, and easily. And so he, he did, and it's a great story. It's, uh, it's called Bruchko is the, is the book. It's out there on the book table if you want to check it out. I, I love missionary stories, and this is one of, one of the best. And it's a Swede from St. Paul, so how, how can you go wrong? But after, after uh, Bruce had, had made his inroads to the Motelone people and earned their trust and really became a, an important part of their tribe, he was captured by guerrilla fighters. Now, now, kids, when I say that, you're probably thinking of a large monkey that doesn't have a tail, but uh, these are commandos who are, who are out in the woods, not, not gorillas, but uh, they're called gorillas. And, and, and the, the commandos tried to, tried to get Bruce to uh, use his influence in the Motelone tribe to, to give up rights to their territory and things of that nature and, and to join their, their Marxist their Marxist cause. And Bruce said, no, I'm not going to do that. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to use my influence to do something that would harm, harm the people that I love so much. And they said, well, we'll see about that. And so they, they clapped an iron around his ankle, put a chain on and put the other end of a chain around a palm tree. And they chained him to a palm tree for four months. And he writes about his clothes rotting off. He developed diverticulitis. He had internal bleeding. He was struggling with hallucinations. And, and yet what, what he wrote was that he would pray every day, Father, I'm alive. And I want to use this time constructively. How can I be useful to you today? Which is an amazing kind of attitude to have while you're chained to a palm tree, getting one serving of some kind of yucca plant soup, which probably tastes about like it sounds. How, How can you pray chained to a palm tree God, how can I be useful to you today? Here's, here's what Bruce says. He says, I learned from experience that even when I couldn't sense what God was doing, I could trust that he was always there, always working out his sovereign will. I learned from experience that even when I couldn't sense what God was doing, when I was too overwhelmed by all the things going on around me, to notice or appreciate his complex orchestrations of things, I could trust God's sovereignty. Sovereignty is a fancy word that means to be in control of things. When we talk about God's sovereignty, we're talking about God being in control of all things. And that includes the hardest, most miserable times of your life. In 1 Samuel 26, we find David being the subject of incredible hostility and hatred. Why? The the simple answer is jealousy. King Saul was jealous of David. He was jealous of David's success. He was jealous of David's popularity. And jealousy can make us want to destroy David another person. You might 
suffer. (laughs) You will suffer. You might suffer because you are a Christian. This is increasingly the case in our world today, is it not? And don't, don't expect that you can go onto a university campus today and speak about God as creator, God as the moral lawgiver who must be followed and obeyed. Don't expect that you can, you can be an outspoken Christian on a university campus and not face hostility and not face hatred. But you might face hostility for other reasons. You might live for God and you might live in a way that pleases God and become very successful. And you know, less successful people tend to hate those who are more successful. We're, we're not too hostile towards those who are poorer than us, are we? We tend to be compassionate to them. But don't we have a tendency to look at those who have more money than us and say, What's wrong with them? I bet they cheated. I bet there's something. I bet there's something wrong with them. If you were to read the book of Proverbs and to absorb its principles into your life, principles about honesty and integrity and making good friends and and controlling your temper, principles about hard work, principles about honoring God, you might find yourself incredibly successful. And successful people stir up jealousy in others. And that's exactly what's been happening in the life of David. And that's what's going on here in 1 Samuel chapter 26. This chapter is the the final chapter in a long string of attempts by King Saul to destroy David. You can go all the way back to chapter 18. Saul has several times thrown spears at David, trying to impale him in the palace. He's tried to get David killed by sending him on impossible missions. In chapter 22, Saul ordered a massacre on the priests of Nob and their families. Why? Because they helped David. The priest there just gave David some bread and Saul ordered a hit job on the entire village. Eighty priests and their wives and their children were massacred because Saul's hatred of David ran that deep. Saul would, in chapter 24 and here in chapter 26, march out after David with all of his armies. The best of his men. 3,000 men he's coming at David with. Imagine that. Put yourself in David's shoes. Imagine having the governor and 3,000 of the best state troopers dedicated to finding and destroying you. Imagine what life would be like. When we're in these conflict kind of situations, we didn't ask for it, didn't want it, we find ourselves the subject of, or the object of great hostility. Everything in life feels chaotic, doesn't it? Maybe you've been here before. Nothing feels safe. Nothing feels certain. And, and in those moments, when, when you're being hated, and you don't even know why, maybe, you want to find some stability. You want to find some rest. And that rest is in the sovereignty of God. That God is in control of all things. Even the bad ones. Even the hard ones. But, trusting God, and and you know this, trusting God doesn't mean that you sit on your hands and do nothing. And say, well, I'm trusting God, so that means I do nothing. Because God works out his sovereignty through, through means, through people, through circumstances. Paul trusted in God's sovereignty, and yet when they were trying to kill him in Damascus, and the Christians said, hey, jump in this basket, we're going to ship you over the wall. You know what he did? He got in the basket, <laughs> and he went. And there were other times when 
Paul, trusting fully in God's sovereignty, said to people who were trying to destroy him, he said, hey, you know what the law says? You might want to think twice before you go breaking the law because you'll be in big trouble. So, so trusting in God's sovereignty doesn't mean we do nothing. But isn't it hard to know what to do when you're under fire? When you're in the midst of those chaotic situations, it's, it's high pressure. We don't always think clearly when we're under pressure, do we? It's, it's, it's very difficult. Do you know that phrase, the fog of war? The fog of war, it's, it's when you're in a, a wartime kind of situation and you just can't see clearly. Things are shrouded. There's things happening that you don't know about. Your enemy is trying to sneak up on you. You, you, can't, you can't know exactly what it is that you should do. So, so I want to give you this morning from 1 Samuel 26, maybe I can say it this way, Three little lights that will help guide your steps through the fog of war, through, through dark and difficult circumstances. When you find yourself hated, when you find yourself the object of attack. Verse 1. Saul came, or sorry, the, the Ziphites came to Saul at Gibeah, saying, Is not David hiding himself on the hill of Hakilah, which is on the east of Jeshimon? Now this is, so you're like, who are the Ziphites? Ziph is a town in Judah. David is from the tribe of Judah. These are David's fellow tribesmen. And they say to Saul, Hey, that guy you're looking for? We know where he's at. He's over here. Like, thanks, guys. That was really kind of you. This is the second time they've done that. Probably they did it the first time, and then they thought, hmm, if David ever becomes king, we're toast. So now, now uh, we got, they're invested in getting rid of David as well. In any case, not very, not very kind. It's true, isn't it, that in conflict and when, when the pressure's on, you don't always know who your friends are. I had an interesting conversation with a couple of pastor friends of mine this week. I was asking them about friendship in the ministry and friend, pastors and their friends. And you know what both of them said? They both said, basically, I've been betrayed enough times I don't even try anymore. I, I made friends and then some sort of problem came along and they turned on me. They said, I love my people, won't be friends with them. I thought that was very sad, but you perhaps know how that feels. Verse 2, Saul arose and went down to the wilderness of Ziph with 3,000 chosen men of Israel to seek David in the wilderness of Ziph. And Saul encamped on the hill of Hekilah, which is beside the road on the east of Jeshimon. But David remained in the wilderness When he saw that Saul came after him into the wilderness, David sent out spies and learned that Saul had indeed come. Then David rose and came to the place where Saul had encamped. Now that's a little weird. Because if somebody's coming after you, you should probably go the other way. (laughs) But he goes toward Saul. And David saw the place where Saul lay with Abner, the son of Ner, the commander of his army, Saul was lying within the encampment, or the, the Hebrew is a, within a circle. Perhaps they circled the wagons around him. He's in the most secure place in the camp while the army was encamped around him. Then David said to Ahimelech the Hittite and to Joab's brother, Abishai, the son of Zeruiah. Zeruiah is David's sister. That makes Abishai David's nephew. And he's crazy. These boys are just nuts, Joab and Abishai and Asahel. We'll, we'll get to know them throughout the story of David, but they're nuts. They're always ready to kill somebody, and uh, they're just crazy. And, and you'll see this here. David said to these two guys, Ahimelech and Abishai, hey, who wants to go with me into the camp of Saul? And Abishai said, yeah, I'll, I'll do that. See, he's nuts. Who wants to go with me uh, down in the middle of the enemy? And Ahimelech's like, are you nuts? 
Not a chance. And Abishai's like, oh yeah, I'm in. Now, this is a kind of sometimes a good friend to have, right? Guy who's willing to go with you anywhere and do anything. Abishai reminds me of uh, Gimli the Dwarf in uh, Lord of the Rings. At the end, they're at the Black Gate and they're going to storm the gates of Mordor. Remember that? And, and so they float this plan and, and remember what Gimli says? He says, certainty of death, small chance of success. What are we waiting for? That's Abishai. That's Abishai. He's all in. He's, he's up for an adventure. Verse 7, so David and Abishai went to the army by night. So it's dark out. No flashlights. Not that you want to use one. And there lay Saul sleeping within the encampment with his spear stuck in the ground at his head. And Abner and the army lay around him. Then Abishai said to David, so, so I love this. I want you to picture this. It's dark. All you can hear is, I don't know if they have crickets over in Palestine. Anna can tell us in Sunday school. She's going to share about her trip to Israel during the Sunday school hour. And so she can tell us if there's crickets there at night. But anyway, it's night. It's quiet. It's dark. You've got 3,000 people, trained soldiers, the best of the best, in a circle. And David and Abishai actually managed to get to the middle of this encampment. I don't know why they wanted to do this in the first place. I scratch my head still. I think, what is David thinking? What does he plan to do? Why does he think this is a good idea? But he does it. And so I want you to imagine this. Like every step, you're like, please don't step on a stick. Please don't step on a stick. Please don't kick a jar over. And, and they make it all the way to the middle and they're being so quiet and they get to where they're standing over Saul and what do they do? They start talking. <laughs> they start talking. In fact, they kind of start arguing. It's just, I, I love this story. It's just wild. Abishai said to David, God has given your enemy into your hand this day. Now please let me pin him to the earth with one stroke of the spear. I will not strike him twice. He's saying, I'll get him the first shot. He's not gonna, Saul is not gonna wake up and go, ah, and wake everybody else up. I'll just get him in one shot. It'll be clean, it'll be quiet, we'll be out of here. Nobody will even know. And Abishai could have done it too. He's amazing. But David said to Abishai, do not destroy him for who can put out his hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless. When you're in the pressure cooker, when you're in conflict, here's one light to help guide your path. You want to trust God? You want to trust God's sovereignty? The first way you do that is by maintaining moral clarity. Maintaining moral clarity. What does moral clarity mean? It it means being able to see clearly what is right and what is wrong. Whatever David was going to do in that moment, he was not going to commit murder. Why? That's wrong. And I just want to remind you, you know this, you will never face a stronger temptation to do wrong than when you're under fire, than when you're under pressure, than when someone is doing you wrong, than when they're coming after you, trying to destroy you. In that moment, you can justify just about anything in your mind, even murder. Kids know this firsthand. If one kid punches another kid, what does the kid who gets punched do? (laughs) He punches back. Now, we had a rule about this at my house when I was a kid because I had brothers. My son didn't have brothers. He didn't need this rule. I had brothers. I needed this rule. Here's the rule. You don't punch your brother. And, uh, of course, we would break that sometimes. We never punched each other in the face. My brother Keith could punch me in the shoulder so hard and just right so that my arm didn't work for five minutes. I, just, I couldn't hit him back because it just hung there <laughs> limp. And, uh, or he would hit me right in the quads right there and, and I couldn't chase him. So, so he was really good at that. But, but I would try to punch him back and I, I never could hit him in the right spot on the shoulder there. And my dad would say, Joe, don't you punch your brother. And I would say what every kid says, which is, he hit me first. 
yeah. And you know what my dad would say? I don't care. The rule is you don't punch your brother. That was a really important lesson for me to learn. Like, like my brothers punching me did not suspend the rule. The rule still stood. The rule still stands. Remember last week we looked at David and Nabal? Probably wasn't his given name. Nabal means fool, moron. So his, I, I doubt his mother said when he was born, <laughs> let's name him moron. Um, but maybe, maybe he just had that face, you know, that even, even a mother couldn't love. David ran into Nabal. Nabal treated him badly. Remember what David said? Boys, strap on your swords. We're going killing. And Abigail came and said, hey, no, no. You, you, you don't want to do this. And, and, and he didn't. By, by God's grace, David didn't. You know, it's so easy to lose our cool when we're under pressure, isn't it? It's so easy to, to fall into the heat of the moment. And it's in these moments under pressure that we have to maintain moral clarity. Whatever it is that we do in those moments that are stressful and they're difficult and they're confusing and they're complicated, whatever you do in that moment, you must not do wrong. You have to trust God's sovereignty, trust God to take care of you. And you can't trust God to take care of you and break his rules at the same time. So let me give you three little pointers when we think about maintaining moral clarity. First, I want to encourage you to beware of opportunism. Sometimes you're going to find a situation that seems perfectly, divinely orchestrated for you to get what you want. Here's David and Abishai. They're standing over Saul. It's literally a miracle. We'll read about this. God put them to sleep. And Abishai, in verse 8, he concludes what anybody would conclude. He says, God has given your enemy into your hand this day. God wants you to kill him. Doesn't doesn't that seem logical? Doesn't that seem plausible? Why else would God put the army to sleep so that Saul could walk right up to him? I, I want you to understand this. Opportunity does not equal God's approval. If you're in a difficult marriage this morning, things are not going well, between you and your wife and you get home from church and you you get out of the car and you hear the sound of angels singing and you look up and the heavens are opening and a beautiful woman is descending out of the clouds and she lands, she touches the ground ever so lightly, flowers in her hair and she looks at you and she says, you're just the person I've been looking for my entire life. What do you do in that moment? You run, (laughs) you run, you run to my house, I'll put the shower on cold, I'll stick you in there until it's over, okay? Opportunity does not equal God's approval. God gave you a wife, you love her. You might find yourself strapped financially, Things are difficult, and, and, and you get a job offer just out of the blue. It just comes out of the blue from nowhere for triple the money. But it's a business that's a little bit shady. It's a little bit unethical. What do you do in that moment? You go back to your lousy job, and you trust God. You maintain moral clarity In that situation, you do what is right. Beware of opportunism. Just because God put the armies to sleep does not mean that David has the green light to kill Saul. Secondly, and this is related, you need to embrace God's boundaries. Embrace God's boundaries. 
I don't remember how old I was when I realized that we actually have rules for war. Isn't that amazing? I'm, I still marvel at that. Like, so if we're going to go to war with another country, we have to follow the rules? Of course, not every nation does, but, but we have rules. Like, this is how civilized people fight. Like, don't shoot civilians. Don't shoot prisoners. When you go out on the field of battle afterwards and, and the enemy soldiers are, are, are lying there wounded, we actually have rules. I say, pick them up and take care of them and treat them humanely. Stick them in your hospitals. We have rules about wearing uniforms. See, see there's, a, there's a right and a wrong way to do war. And, and you have this, hopefully, in your house. You tell your kids, look, if you're going to fight, don't stab each other with a knife. <laughs> Don't fight with baseball bats. There are certain words that you can't use when you're talking to your sibling. Husbands and wives, you fight sometimes. You better have rules around your fighting. Like, don't you dare lay a finger on her, mister. Like, don't threaten to leave over... 2% milk or whole milk, really? That's somewhere you just can't go. God has put boundaries even around our conflicts. And when, when we're in the pressure cooker and when we're fighting for our life, we must fight properly. And David comes there and he says, I can't kill him. Whatever, I, whatever I'm going to do, I can't kill him. I'm not touching God's anointed. That's outside the bounds. And so that leads to our third little point here as we think about maintaining moral clarity. That's this. Remember God has options. Remember God has options. I love verse 10. David says to Abishai as they're fighting, As the Lord lives, the Lord will strike him or his day will come to die or he'll go down into the battle and perish. Abishai is like, let's kill him. Let's kill him now. You know what David says? No, no. God has options that we don't have. God can kill him. And that's that's exactly what David saw with Nabal, wasn't it? Got into a conflict with Nabal and God killed him. Well, that's, that's one way to put an end to conflict. God just kills your enemy. That can happen. God can do that. You can't. Some problems you can outlive. Remember this. <laughs> See, David says his day will come to die. There are some people in your life who cause you a great deal of grief. Here's, here's some really good advice. Outlive them. <laughs> Just outlive them and they'll be gone. All right? Or... David says he'll go down into battle and perish that way. And you know what? That's exactly what happens to Saul. David says, I I cannot kill Saul, but God can take care of him in his sovereignty and his way. Remember, God has options available to him that you do not when you're under fire. And you leave those options to God. Secondly, secondly, we want to maintain the correct complaint. And this is, I'll try to go through this a little quicker. But in verse 17, so, so, so David and Abishai grab Saul's spear that's like his scepter. It's a symbol of authority, kind of like stealing his crown. They steal his water bottle and, and they leave. And I got to think that Abishai is like, really? We, we came in here for that? But they did. And, and so they left. David has a conversation where he insults Abner for a little while. You can read about that. In verse 17, Saul wakes up. Saul recognized David's voice, verse 17, and said, Is this your voice, my son David? And David said, It is my voice, my lord, O king. And he said, Why does my lord pursue after a servant? For what have I done? What evil is on my hands? Now, therefore, let my lord the king hear the words of his servant. If it's the Lord who has stirred you up against me, may he accept an offering. But if it is men, this is amazing. If it is men, may they be cursed before the Lord. For they have driven me out this day that I should have no share in the inheritance of the Lord, saying, go, serve other gods. 
Now, therefore, let not my blood fall to the earth away from the presence of the Lord. For the king of Israel has come out to seek a single flea, like one who hunts a partridge in the mountains. I want you to notice what David doesn't say. David doesn't say to Saul, Saul, I wish you weren't chasing me. You're hurting my feelings. You're making me feel bad. Like my self-esteem has taken a major shot since you've been chasing me. You're making people think I'm a bad person. You're making my life really hard. He doesn't say, I'm sick of getting betrayed by you, Saul. He has a lot he could complain about, doesn't he? I mean, he really does. He's been running for his life for years now. And there's a lot that he could gripe about. But that's not what David complained about. What did he really complain about? He complained, verse 19, that he's been driven out that he should have no share in the heritage of the Lord. He says, I am an Israelite. I have been promised by God that I can have a chunk of this land. I belong here. This is my nation. God promised me this, and and you people are driving me out. When you're under the fire. Self-pity is a real option, isn't it? (laughs) I am a world champion self-pityer. I shouldn't shouldn't admit that to you this morning, but I don't know if anybody can do it any better than I can do it. Don't ask my wife. That's a real danger, isn't it? Oh, woe is me. Things are so bad. David knows what to complain about and what not to complain about. And what he complains about to Saul is he says, you are violating God's promise to me. That's, a, that's significant. It's, see, this is not about Saul and David. This is about Saul and God. This is about David and God, God's promises. David is reminding Saul that God has made him good and wonderful promises and God will not let his promises fall. Saul, you are on dangerous ground keeping me away from the promises of God. You put yourself in dangerous territory. This is not just some personal slight against David. This is, this is violating promises from God. So we want to cling to God's, pres- to, to God's promises. When, when you're under the gun, you, you cling to God's promises. And David says, I've been promised a share in the land. Remember God's promises to you when you're under the gun because he will keep those promises. No matter what, no matter how hard the forces who hate you, the people who hate you, no matter how much all the world might conspire against you to deprive you, you cannot be deprived of the promises of God. They will come true. And David is reminding Saul of that. He's also clinging to God's presence. You see verse 20, Therefore let not my blood fall to the earth away from the presence of the Lord. David had a right as one of God's people, to the presence of the Lord. What does he mean? What does he mean there? Don't let me die away from the presence of the Lord. He has to mean, he has to mean something like, because this is the same David who knows that God is everywhere. This is the same David who wrote in Psalm 139, where can I go from your presence? Where can I flee from your spirit? So, so why is David saying, don't let me die away from your presence? I think he's saying, he's recognizing that God's presence is in a special way, in a special place. The house of worship, the tent of worship, the tabernacle. And as one of God's people, God's chosen people, David has every right to be there. And Saul and his people are keeping David away from that place. 
And, and David is complaining about that. And he's right to do that. He's right to do that. This is the correct complaint. Don't allow me to perish away from the presence of the Lord. That's not good for you, Saul. That's not good for you. Thirdly, and let's button this up, we want to maintain a clear conscience. We want to maintain a clear conscience when we're under the gun. I, I, I marvel at David's words beginning in verse 21. Well, Saul speaks first. Saul says, I've sinned. Return, my son David. Come, come back. I, I'll, I will no more do you harm because my life was precious in your eyes this day. Behold, I've acted foolishly and made a great mistake. My bad. Sorry. Sorry, I tried to kill you. But just come back. And you know what David says? He says, you know what? Just send a boy over. I'll give you your spear back. I'll give you your water bottle back. I'm not going over there while you're awake. It was Matthew Henry that said, those who have once been false are not easily trusted another time. You don't have to trust the people who betrayed you. You can forgive them, but you don't have to trust them. David doesn't trust Saul here. What does David trust? Verse 23, David says to Saul, the Lord rewards every man for his righteousness and his faithfulness. For the Lord gave you into my hand today, and I would not put out my hand against the Lord's anointed. David trusts what we could call the law of sowing and reaping. The law of sowing and reaping. You will reap what you sow. And what David is saying here is, Saul, I have been righteous and I have been faithful. I have not returned evil on your head. I have not fought in kind. I have, I have only done what is right. I have not sinned against you. I have not harmed you. I have been righteous. I have been faithful. And God will reward me for that. This is amazing. The, for, for David to have gone through years of this kind of persecution and oppression and come to this moment and be able to say before Saul and before the whole world, you know that I have done nothing wrong to you over all these years. That's remarkable because it's so easy to do wrong when we're under the gun, when we're under pressure, when we're under fire. But this clear conscience gives David tremendous confidence in God, in God's sovereignty, in God's care. He says, may my life be precious in God's sight and may he deliver me out of all tribulation. And David has every reason to believe God is going to hear that prayer and answer it, doesn't he? You know that God doesn't hear and answer all prayers, right? If you've got a guy who is an axe murderer and he's sitting before the judge and he, and he, and he prays, oh Lord, please let it be an innocent verdict. Please let it be innocent. Please let it be innocent. He has no reason to expect that God will hear that prayer. If you've got a man intending to rob a bank and he says, oh God, please give us safety today in all our endeavors, he shouldn't expect God to hear that prayer. And if you've been under the gun and you've been treated badly and you've acted in kind just as badly, if you've lost your cool, if you've said things that you shouldn't have said, if you've done things that you shouldn't have done, if you have gossiped, if you've tried to destroy the other person because they're destroying you, you have no right to believe that God will hear your prayer. The power of a clear conscience, the confidence of a clear conscience, practical application. Sometimes this is really hard. There will be times in your life when somebody will be trying to destroy you and you'll mess up and you'll sin against them and you're going to have to go to the person who's making your life miserable and say, I'm sorry. I was wrong. I was wrong to treat you that way. Why? Because you need to clear your conscience so you can stand before God and man and say, the Lord rewards every man for his righteousness and faithfulness. The Lord will deliver me out of all tribulation. One of the ways that you trust the Lord when you're under fire is to maintain a clear conscience. Well, Jesus told us that in this world we're going to have trouble. 
and, and we will. Let me tell you the end of Bruce's story as we go. Over time, Bruce earned the trust of his, these commandos as he was chained to this palm tree. There was, there was one day that they actually took him down to the river and they, they jumped in the river for a swim. They left him on the bank with a, with a submachine gun sitting right there. And he, say, he, he writes, he says, I thought about grabbing that thing and mowing them all down and booking it into the jungle. But he said, I couldn't do that. These were people made in the image of God. And, and so he began to develop a relationship with them. And they came to know the Lord, many of them did. They kept, the leader kept pressuring him, you gotta sign this paper, you gotta sign this paper, you gotta, you, you gotta help me out here. And, and he wouldn't do it, and he wouldn't do it, and finally the leader said, okay, you know what, you're done. Three days, you're dead. Three days came, by, came and went, and Bruce was tied to a, tied to a tree, and, and the, the leader of the commandos went and handed out shells to ten, ten guys. And, and Bruce is thinking, these are my friends, and half of them are Christians. They're, they're surely not going to shoot me. Well, they loaded up all their shells. He said, do you want a blindfold? <laughs> he said, no, I want to look him in the eye. Raise their guns. Here, here's, how he, here's how he writes. A commando started the count. Five, four, he prays, God, you are forever faithful. Three, two, take me into your arms. One, fire. He says, my, my ears filled with the deafening sound of rifle reports and I felt nothing. The men in the firing squad stared at me. I stared back. One of the men brought his rifle up to his face and examined it, a bewildered expression on his face. Suddenly he exclaimed, they were blanks. In unison, the firing squad and I swiveled our heads towards Alejandro. He's the leader. He was watching me intently. Our eyes met. Almost imperceptibly, he nodded. Then without a word to me or his men, he turned and walked away. And two weeks later, he was released and he was set free. Now, not every story ends that way. But we serve a God who is sovereign and who can deliver us from all our tribulations. You're going to be under fire. And Jesus promised that it was going to be that way. And when you do, you need to handle that properly. You need to go through that well. You need to maintain moral clarity. You need to make sure that you gripe about the right things. You need to trust the sovereignty of God. Heavenly Father, we don't like conflict. We don't like confrontation. We don't like pressure. We don't like unjust treatment. The Father, you have promised to be with us. So help us to trust you, to trust your sovereignty, and to trust you in the right way. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.